to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense. From culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from and the businesses and more importantly the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. Welcome to this week's conversation where I'm exceptionally excited to be chatting to Naomi Duncan, who is the chief executive of the charity Chefs in Schools. And in my humble opinion, this is an awesome conversation that should be heard by as many people as possible. Although, of course, I utterly adore hospitality and the amazing world of food and drink, there's no getting away from the fact that as a species, we humans have a problem. We are fat. We have one of the highest obesity rates in the world in the UK, and therefore I often question my role as a restaurateur and whether I am making the situation worse. Part of the reason for this podcast's existence is for me, and hopefully you, to learn. To try and find out where is the sweet spot between loving food and drink, but not wanting to destroy the planet or make people sick. So I go off on a journey every single week and chat to people about their chosen niche or area of expertise. And I've learned so much. I don't have all the answers, but I like to consider myself pretty well informed and with a genuinely insatiable curiosity to continue that adventure and learning journey. What is pretty obvious is that we need to improve our relationship with food as a species. We need to understand more about why we eat a diet that all too often makes both us and the planet sick. But we also need to celebrate the incredible things that can happen around food and hospitality. The connections made, the time with friends and loved ones, the breaking bread and all too often the very reason for being is the social interactions that happened around hospitality and being hospitable. So with so much to gain and so much to learn, surely it makes sense to start this journey as early as possible. As in, really, from birth. And not too long after birth starts education. Of course, at home, and then maybe nursery, and ultimately a pretty long time at schools. Surely, this is the place to improve knowledge on food. On what we should eat, to inspire a lifelong love for whole food, and to understand the difference between real food and processed food. To understand that food is essential for life, and that in the modern world, nobody should be going hungry to try and fathom how on earth it is possible for the same areas struck by food poverty and lack of access to food to at the same time be suffering from diabetes and obesity due to the shocking quality of the food that may be available. It's just so bloody obvious. How on earth have we allowed ourselves to have an education system that spends so little time on the one thing we put in our bodies every single day that nourishes us, that gives us energy, that fuels our bodies and our minds. We cannot achieve our potential either individually or as a collective unless we fuel ourselves efficiently. I can't really understand how we're getting it so wrong, but as always, I'm so bloody excited about the potential for us to do it better. And luckily, we don't need to start from scratch. Since Jamie Oliver told us about the turkey twizzler, we've at least been on an upward trajectory of knowledge of understanding that the situation is broken and we need to focus on improvement and change. But it is taking time and that's frustrating. But I like to believe the trajectory is at least positive. And actually through COVID, the hospitality sector and people like Marcus Rashford have really helped ensure that food poverty and access to food at school has stayed in the limelight. And Naomi Duncan and chefs in schools are right in the midst of the beating heart of this debate and trailblazing some of the improvements that can be made. They will soon be working with over 70 schools, predominantly in London, but with grand plans to work with or inspire a transformation across thousands, if not tens of thousands of schools. Now in this chat we dive into understanding what the problem with school food is. How have we ended up here? What should be done? What can be done? And what, in fact, is already being done? The impact that Naomi and the Chefs in Schools team are having is exceptional and very exciting. 
Whether helping get fully trained restaurant style chefs into schools or working with existing teams, they are focused not only on providing better food in the canteens, but working with the curriculum in educating children and inspiring them around what good food can look like. But whatever you do, don't call the food healthy. Since they've learned the hard way, that can turn the average teenager off. I learned a huge amount and I hope many of you listening will be inspired to speak to your local schools. If you're a parent, perhaps you can ask better questions of your kid's school. But if you work in the sector, why not reach out to your local school and see if you can help? I've personally found working with my local primary school in inspiring and teaching children about real food and seasonality and presentation and the ethics of food has been hugely entertaining and exceptionally rewarding. Right, before we get on with the show, can I just ask, if you enjoy this episode or other episodes, can you please do me two pretty quick favours? Can you firstly head over to humansofhospitality.co.uk and sign up to the weekly newsletter, where every Monday morning I will send you a short email about this week's guest, with some useful links about any websites or social media channels or points of interest that come up whilst we are chatting. That'll save you the hassle of trying to remember whilst you are listening, and I promise I won't share your data and I won't hassle you for anything else. And whilst you're there, if you can make a donation to support this podcast, there are two very useful buttons. One for PayPal for some one-off support, and one for Patreon for some easy monthly support. If everyone listening just paid a fiver, a couple of cups of coffee a month, I could make this podcast a whole lot more awesome, with more time to chat to more guests and travel to meet in person, some great hosting, recording and promotional kit. I promise I will invest it wisely. Secondly, could you please pick up your podcast player and subscribe, rate, review and share this podcast with your network. The more I can demonstrate to potential guests how many people are listening and enjoying these conversations, the easier it is for me to convince them to spare an hour in their diary to have a chat. So the better reviews, the better guests, and the more you will enjoy these conversations. It's all round win-win, plus you'll make me very happy. Okay, thank you so much. Let's get over and meet Naomi. Naomi Duncan, Chief Executive of the charity Chefs in Schools. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Hugely appreciated. Uh, can you just tell people listening, sort of how are you and where are you in the world, please, Naomi? Sure. Yes. So thank you very much for having me on. Um, and I am very well, thank you. Very busy. Uh, life is all busy Chefs in Schools wise. Um, and I'm currently in Little Venice uh, on a canal boat, as you are. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, well, we just chatted about this before we started. So you live on a boat. I do, which feels ridiculous, but at the same time feels like a kind of lovely oasis of peace in London. So I think that's perfect, isn't it? Because, yeah, London can be crazy, but it's beautiful, isn't it? Once you get down on the canals. I remember I used to live in London and I used to think it was amazing. Just it's a, a world apart that you can walk out the city. And then I remember those beautiful areas of the canals and the kind of trees and the grass. It was it was lovely. So, yeah, nice part of the world. Indeed. Good. Well, look, thank you so much for joining me. So um, I I've often in this podcast sort of end up chatting to people who have a particular interest because you know, it's all areas of hospitality. So whether that's the restaurateurs or the chefs, but all too often producers and, and quite often get into a sort of ecological environment, nutritious, vegans and all sorts of conversations. And then, um, you know, kind of haven't really got back to the roots of this and, and, and all of this, all of these sort of challenges and opportunities, I suppose, around food really boils back to kids as the most things I suppose because that's the future so I'm really excited to try and understand you know what what's going on with children and food and schools and all that sort of stuff but before we talk specifically about what chefs in schools do um I just want to understand sort of you know what's the problem I suppose why you exist and what's happening so can you just explain a little bit to me about you know what's going out on out there in schools uh, or, or just children in general with regards to food for sure, and I think I think you've got the you've hit the nail on the head, right? We can deal with all of the different things to do with food, but unless we start changing habit at a young age, we're not going to change how the future looks. And I think that's kind of core and core to our principles is you know get get kids, mould them, and teach them to love real food, and hopefully they grow into adults who also love real food and are interested in cooking it and growing it and enjoying it. So. I guess in terms of the problem out there, um, I don't think we can escape the kind of reality that the entire Western world has a problem with obesity and diet-related disease. And that's kind of where 
where we started was thinking how do you how do you have an impact you can't solve everything with school food but how do you have an impact on childhood obesity how do you start reducing levels of that and how do you stop it turning into kind of adult unhealthy relationships with food and so that was kind of the founding principle was if we teach kids about food in schools if we take the concept that in schools kids are learning much more than just you know science and maths they're also learning social interaction they're also learning how to get on with each other they're learning kind of skills uh, all sorts of soft skills outside of um, core education surely food's a really big part of that and surely we have really great opportunities when kids are school in school to give them an education about food and so mm. our model is based around thinking that actually the food that you eat in the dining room and how you eat it and the interaction that you have there is as much a part of education as anything else that's happening in school so how do you take food in schools that's quite often it's outsourced when it is outsourced schools kind of think oh well that's for the caterer to deal with and how do you bring it back into the center of school and so that's that was that was kind of where we started and I guess it's growing from there into also thinking about you know food in schools goes beyond just the kind of immediate need for nutrition but it's also in some cases when you boil it back a free school meal can be the only meal that that child eats in the day so there are so many different reasons why school food matters and why we should pay a bit more attention to it and so that I guess is what we're trying to do we're trying to kind of a bit of a ground up revolution in terms of how things are done um, and then thinking also about how how important school food is and how we change the conversation around it yeah amazing so so just to understand, I suppose that you know the the problem a little bit more before we get into the solution. Has this changed? Because because it, it makes you know it, it's almost incomprehensible to understand why we don't educate people, uh, children <laughs> around food. In the fact that yeah, we, you know obviously you'd like to think, particularly in primary education, the key thing is trying to come out with a nice human. You know that's what we're trying to start <laughs> with. But maybe more than an educated human, uh, albeit I'm I'm probably you know slightly deluded optimist. I should say that my, my wife's actually a primary school teacher, so we do chat about this stuff quite a lot I guess and around you know what, what are we supposed to be doing testing the arse out of them or actually helping them be good humans is, is this mm-hmm. changed over time historically were we better than this and, and was food part of the curriculum if you go back I don't know 70 80 years is this a, is this a new problem or actually have we have we never really nailed this in in all the time that we've been helping children become adults I think I think it's gone on a journey, right? Because there there are two things: there's school food itself, and then there's education around food. And we're quite interested in linking the two and saying actually consider the two as one and teach kids about food and feed them the food that you're teaching them about. If you see what I mean. But I think if you, if you go back, even if you go back sort of thirty odd years, things look very different, and kids were being taught different skills in schools. So taught how to you know things like domestic, you know, domestic science as it as it was, to like teach kids about a little bit about household budgeting and a little bit about how to make basic foodstuffs. Um, and at the same time food in school was treated quite differently and um, probably more like 40 odd years ago. You know, food in school was treated quite differently and it generally was freshly made and it generally was, you know, not outsourced to the same degree that it is today. Um, and I, I I feel like it's both things have gone on quite a bit of a roller coaster. There was kind of the implementation of this wonderful thing called compulsive competitive tendering, which I'm sure I don't need to explain to lots of people, but effectively meaning that a lot of schools were encouraged to outsource um, their school food provision. And then within the marketplace, a lot of pressure then put on the market to continuously reduce costs, which inevitably was leading to kind of a de-skilling of school kitchens and then that led to a reduction in food quality and then you had this big moment when Jeanette Ori and Jamie Oliver teamed up 15 20 years ago and said well hold on this has gone too far and kids are now being fed you know burgers and chips every day and surely that's not right so there was this kind of wonderful moment then of the entire country going oh actually maybe we'll have a rethink so there was a big improvement then in terms of standards there was a lot of kind of slightly misleading press around you know parents shoving burgers through bars of school food which wasn't actually that accurate a representation of what happened um but it led it did it led to a big improvement with a lot more fresh food um being introduced in schools but maybe not so much focus on the education and then about six or so years ago um our chair henry dimbleby co-authored the school food plan which led to amongst other things the introduction of things like universal infant free school meals so now all um younger children in primary schools get a completely free school meal it led to getting getting rid of this kind of 
nutritionally based way of creating menus, which was very dull and technical, but basically meant that chefs had to type their menu into a computer system to work out the precise balance of macro and micronutrients and was kind of sucking innovation out of menu development. And it also led to um, school cooking in schools being put back on the curriculum as a requirement. So all children up to key stage three I think so just when they're entering secondary school have to be taught a little bit about cooking um so it's kind of it's it, it's gone on a journey and I, I I would be lying if I sat here today and said oh everything's terrible and there's all this every everywhere is just doing bland beige boring food but I guess we think there's still too many schools where actually despite all of the improvements there is a kind of overemphasis on in the kitchens kind of packet mixes and beige food being served up on the counter. Uh, on the counters and food in, in classrooms either not being taught at all or when it is taught being around kind of things like you know, cakes and tray bakes and how to make a basic fruit salad and not really giving kids the skills when they leave schools to be able to cook properly for themselves so yeah I think I think that's probably where we are ha there have been big improvements you know and there's been a lot of trailblazers who've, who've gone before and we're, we're just kind of now coming in and saying actually there are ways of doing things differently still that can make it even better yeah okay it makes sense i i guess a lot of this as well you know sort of thinking about it as you were chatting is that this move to sort of over processed food and the type of food that was cooked in schools was really just reflecting what was going on out of schools mm. as well. I suppose you go back 40, 50 years, everybody was making fresh food where there was, you know, there wasn't really processed food, food wasn't made in factories. So I suppose schools just sort of ran in parallel and, and hopefully the same thing is happening. Um, but I guess it's, it's happening in niches and it's some people are becoming, you know, increasingly obsessive about where their food comes from and whether, you know, whether it's fresh, whether it's processed whole foods and whether it's organic, but at the same time, there is still a lot of shit out there. Um, yeah. As well as the, um, <laughs> excuse my French, um, as well as the sort of the health side of it, you've got this poverty side of it as well. So I think I, I was reading that, you know, there's 1.3 million kids a day qualify for free school meals, but there's 4 million children potentially living in a sort of food insecure households. What does that mean? What's your understanding around the sort of, yeah, I suppose the, the, the welfare and, and poverty side of food? I think I think the two are kind of inextricably linked right because you go to the areas with the highest levels of socioeconomic deprivation and you find that levels of childhood obesity and malnutrition are higher than anywhere else so in the poorest areas one in three kids are leaving primary school obese and you compare that you know across the country it's one in five which is still completely unacceptable but it's it, the, the problems are so much it's so much harder to tackle in in the poorest areas and it's it is so disproportionately weighted that way which is why i kind of go back to a meal in school is really important because not only is it this opportunity to educate and the opportunity to give nutrition but it's also potentially a child's only meal that day it doesn't that's not the case for all children entitled to free school meals but there are definitely kids who we know come into school not having had breakfast and that they really rely on that meal which makes it so important to get it right and yes, the, the, the stats you've given are completely accurate. So 1.3 million children pre-pandemic enjoying a, a, the opportunity to have a, a free meal in school. But actually, it's now more than 4 million kids living in food insecure households. So I, I guess one of the one of the things that chefs in schools are doing, along with a group of 20 other um, NGOs and civil organisations is campaigning to get the recommendations from the National Food Strategy implemented in full, one of which, which hasn't been touched yet, is extending free school meals so that all kids who live in food insecure households have the opportunity to have that meal in school. Um, and, you know, we've, we, we've seen it firsthand. I, I don't want to dwell too much on COVID because I'm sure we're all sick of it. But during the, during the pandemic, when the minute that schools shut, because our work is predominantly focused in areas with high levels of socioeconomic deprivation, we realised kind of straight away, oh, there's going to be a lot of free school meal kids who aren't getting their meal in school, but also a lot of families who are in a similar situation. So we kind of reinvented ourselves and we're producing these emergency food parcels throughout the um, the lockdown and it just brought us kind of even closer to the reality of it so we were talking to families we were talking to kids you know 11 and 11 12 year old kids who were worried on the last day of school thinking oh you know I, I'm the person that's meant to make sure that um, my little sister gets food and we don't have any food at home and I, I, I'm really worried and I just think you know the stats around child food poverty are 
are pretty shaming, actually. Um, and as I said, you can't solve everything with school food, but it does go a long way to making sure that that access is there. Mm. It's heartbreaking to understand the severity of the problem, I suppose. And I guess there was an opportunity there to get right into the coalface and, and to learn about it. Why, you know, does does the government understand what's going on and why have they not managed to resolve this? Is it too hard or is there a lack of effort? <sighs> I mean, I think it's I think it's really complicated. I think we could bash successive governments of all different colours for not solving the problem of child poverty. Um, You know, it's it's this is not a new problem, and I think it is going to take like a a really um, a kind of a political consensus to be able to to get this kind of initiative through. And I do think that there is thing. I do think that not it's not that government entirely wants to dismiss the problem and say it doesn't exist i think there is an awareness um but i think the problem is really complicated so if 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 you take for example one of the recommendations in the national food strategy is extending free meals to all families of um who are in receipt of universal credit and actually implementing that becomes then quite complicated for government because it's linked to all sorts of other funding that schools get so trying to work out a way in which you can deal with some of the problems of, of um, child food poverty without then messing up a load of interlinked systems. It, it does become complicated, but that is no excuse not to tackle it. And I guess what we're trying to do with, with these other organisations is just keep that pressure up and, you know, it's it's not going away. And I, I don't want to be, be a downer because I think there's lots of reasons to be positive at the moment, but it's not as though the economic situation is going to get better and it is going to kind of continue squeezing those at the poorest end of society. So now is like the right moment. We've got this momentum. We've got people publicly interested in it. You've got the will of the people behind you. This is a good spent, you know, a good use of of tax money. Let's do something to tackle it. Mm, Interesting. You're right around the complexity around sort of, yeah, uh, free school meals and how it impacts the rest of the school. Because it always used to amaze me. I was a school governor and a primary school for five years. And and it used to blow my mind that all too often when we were talking about, you know, what our budget was going to be for the following year, that it would be linked to the extra funding that came about as a result of, yeah, how many kids have you got that qualify for free school meals? And, And as a result, you also then get additional funding for lots of other support in the school and it just seemed bonkers particularly since not not always people who may qualify for free school meals don't even actually claim them totally. and as a result yeah. the school doesn't get the money for all of the other things it should be doing so you're right it, it, it seems crazy um, we shouldn't give up on that it, 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 it can't be that hard to resolve but there are things entwined <laughs> that people probably you know I had absolutely no idea and every time the head teacher tried to explain it to me it, it blew my mind uh, the complexity <laughs> of it um, but fundamentally you would say then there's a lot of people who should be you know well, you, you would like all primary schools children to get free school meals and, and at the moment that's not the case there is a qualifying criteria and you would perceive that qualify, qualifying criteria as being too limited I take it a hundred percent. I mean, in my heart of hearts, and this is a personal view rather than official stance that we're taking at chefs and schools, I would like all kids in school to be getting a free meal because I think it's, I, I don't, I wouldn't see it as being a free meal. I would see it as being a kind of an extension of education. You have an opportunity through a meal in school to shape a child's eating habits. You also have the opportunity to get immediately some nutritious food into them. And you also have the opportunity then for the for the benefits that that can have for behaviour and attainment. You know, if a kid eats a decent meal at lunchtime, it helps them concentrate more in the afternoon. That has benefits for behaviour and attainment as well. I just can't see it. anything that couldn't be solved in that regard by um, making sure. I just don't see any reason not to do it other than obviously cost. And I personally think it's an investment that's worthwhile. But as I said, that's, you know, that's, that's a bit of a pipe dream. And at the moment, the focus has to be on making sure that those who literally cannot afford it and who are, might, otherwise might go without food, that has to be the focus. Mm. Okay. And then very shortly going to move into the uh, solution or part of the solution with, with what you're doing. But sort of l- last bit of trying to understand the problem, and, and it really got me thinking over the last couple of days whilst I was you know doing some reading around this, is that there's a billion pounds a year spent on packed lunches and that, that those quite often, or I think it was the, the stats was that only 1% of those were considered to be sort of nutritionally acceptable. And if parents actually invested that money into school lunches, then it, it would solve the problem because they'd been 
enough cash going around to support food in schools. I hadn't really comprehended that. I suppose my perhaps incorrect, and, and I'm going to be motivated to go to my kids' schools and get a little bit more involved, but I, I guess the perception of a lot of parents is that they're doing their kids a favour by not allowing their kids to go and eat what they may uh-huh. perceive as rubbish at school. They're making them a packed lunch, and actually we're in this sort of self-fulfilling cycle. So it, I guess that's changed as well, the number of kids actually paying for school yep. meals. That's, that's gone down over the years. Definitely. And actually, you're completely right about the kind of self-perpetuating cycle of doom, because the less parents that pay, the less money there is in the system, the more contractors and outsourced and schools have to drive down the cost. And in doing so, you reduce quality and less people want to pay. It's just this horrendously vicious cycle. So I'm I'm kind of always up for initiatives that put more money into the system. And then having, you know, really, really good guidelines that make sure that that food is, you know, nutritionally balanced. And then having really good operators out there who are, you know, producing great food. But you do need to have money floating around the system to make that happen. And at the moment, as, as you say, there's, and I think, the kind of one of the outputs of the pandemic has been um, a reduction in, in people eating meals in school, and that is only going to kind of make the problem worse. So, yeah, it's yeah. it's tricky. Yeah, really. It's tricky, but you have to get parents' confidence, and to get parents' confidence, so we we as chefs in schools, our um, our model when we're talking to schools is we're encouraging them to make school meals compulsory where they can, and say actually once you've got the parents' confidence, once you're happy, the food's good, it's nutritious, the kids enjoy it go down the route of just saying well we just we're not a packed lunch school which then makes it financially sustainable for the school to have a decent chef in the kitchen producing decent food yeah it's sort of blindingly (laughs) obvious no but but you're absolutely right and and i think most parents would want that you know so i've got an 11 and 13 year old you know both both at secondary school there's clearly issues going on around because the school have been sending out some surveys recently around canteen usage but but my natural perception would probably have been well it's probably more about what i know my kids would choose more than maybe what's available i would presume that there has to be some sort of you know nutritious uh, option at the school but my daughter even as a restaurateur it would drive me absolutely insane that my daughter given the choice is is going to go for the chips and chicken nugget over the i don't know you know veggie lasagna or whatever it might be um is there a is there a kind of a a sort of a kite mark or an accreditation where that, that already exists where teachers where parents could quite easily go oh look my school has got that that means i know that you know they care about food i know that they're following you know certain guidelines and as a result i'm going to support it or in essence do all schools do that anyway because there is national guidance or oh that's a big question <laughs> yeah, it's a big sorry. question I, I want to say one thing and i'm not sure it's going to be entirely true so there are so there is an accreditation out there that's in uh off the top of my head i think it's over 10,000 schools it's in a considerable amount of them soil association have a program called food for life which was actually established by those kind of school food pioneers um, Jeanette Ori back um, about again about 15 years ago and that accreditation you could with confidence then say that you knew that um, that school food standards were being followed that food was being procured in a way that might make you happy um, and that there was sort of some general quality baselines as well I think it's really hard with any accreditation though Um, and I think I think I think there are schools out there who don't have that kind of thing but might still have really great food so I think I mean, a lot of schools offer the opportunity for parents to come in and have a look at the food on offer. And I always think that's a really smart thing to do because it kind of takes away the mystery of it. And I I kind of, I guess I wonder, and I'd throw maybe a question back to you as a parent around, is it the case that parents think that food in schools isn't good? And do they just accept that that's the case? Because I I guess I, I have a question around whether or not we just accept that school food isn't very good because we all ate rubbish food in schools and so maybe we just think we just price it in so you're never going to convince parents who had a rubbish school meal that school meals today can be completely dramatically different i don't i don't know what your thoughts as a parent uh, are. yeah no it's great yeah my, well my experience is probably mixed you know i i guess the, the two schools because my kids have gone from sort of primary to secondary very recently and it was the primary school where I was a governor so the challenge at the primary school was actually the head was very interested in uh, educating children around food as a a restaurateur with my kids at the school I would go in and and, and help do some things but the problem was they'd outsource the supply of food as a result of that they pretty much got rid of the kitchen this was a sort of historical issue Mm. and then they were stuck in this sort of like yeah how do we that they really wanted to employ a chef and this is some of the questions that we're going to come on to with some of the, the stuff that I'm 
I'm sure comes up and that you solve. But yeah, they wanted to bring it back in house. They wanted to have a chef. I kept saying to them that you know if you had a a head chef in the school, uh, they wouldn't need all of the time they're there to do the actual cooking. So they could then get involved in the curriculum and, and mm-hmm. teaching. But as it was, yes, the food was being bought in from an external provider. I know that provider. You know, it, it was probably pretty decent. I'm probably more concerned at the secondary school because of, like I say, the freedom of choice of the kids and, the, mm. and them deciding what they buy. And I, and I would naturally presume that, like I say, there might be some, I don't know how, how good any of it would be. I suppose the trouble is for me is that there's a lack of um, appreciation and understanding of food in general about, you know, what constitutes good food, even, even as a restaurateur, you know, I know that probably a significant proportion of the customers coming in to my restaurants don't actually care where I'm sourcing the food. And although it's incredibly important to me, a lot of them are motivated by, does it taste nice? Does uh-huh. it fill me up? And and actually, the, you know, the work that we do into securing ethical, seasonal, all that kind of stuff, for the vast majority of people, I, I, I worryingly don't think that they really think about why they're eating strawberries in February or why they're eating asparagus in October. And I think it's important. And, um, and they don't, but then you get into the poverty side of it and you go, it just needs to be, nutritious you know you you you, you're getting yeah too far into it so i could probably answer this question for an hour (laughs) but i do do think there's a mark yeah clearly and and i'm going to do it off the back of you know reading about what you do over the last couple of days i will definitely be getting up in in touch with my school i would imagine in a normal year it probably would have come up already but because of covid you know we haven't the school hasn't been open to external visitors none of the normal inductions that take place have taken place and certainly if i had been invited in as a as a somebody in the industry I absolutely would have been poking around in the kitchen and asking about food as I did at their primary school. But I haven't had that opportunity at secondary Mm -hmm. school. And my presumption would be, even if there is good food available, that my kids probably ideally wouldn't choose that. And as a result, we make a packed lunch because then we're in control. And Uh I would agree on some of the nutritional elements of that, but at least least the calorific element of it, we're in control, Mm. if if not the nutritional element. So I think it's fascinating. And, And I'm motivated... You know, I've worked with a few local schools and I, and I think off the back of this, I'll be even more motivated and, and I guess we'll come into this, but sort of you guys working out of London and regionalizing what happens out of the country and trailblazing and educating, I suppose, is part of it, which means I should probably ask you another question, Naomi, <laughs> which is let's get into then, you know, the sort of, we understand the challenge, we understand the problem. I think it's it's fascinating, um, hard, but actually it looks like there's some quick wins in there. How did Chefs in School come about and, what, and what sort of, what's the primary things that you guys do as a charity? So about... Well, in fact, probably about six, seven years ago, um, there was a there was a school in Hackney um, where our chair Henry sent his kids, um, and the school cook left, and he was chatting with the exec head teacher Louise, and they were saying, you know, is this an opportunity to do things a little bit differently, similar to the conversation I think that you had with the head teacher of your kids' primary school, and so Henry put a tweet out on on Twitter obviously. And it ended up in the hands of a lady called Nicole Pisani, who was the head chef of Nopi, um, which is a, a restaurant in, in Mayfair, an Ottolengi restaurant in Mayfair. And Nicole was kind of going through a period in her life where she was thinking, you know, she'd been head chef for a few years and she was thinking, you know, is this what I want to do with the rest of my life? Is this you know, something I could do that might add back a bit of value? And so she thought, well, well, you know, why not school food? I can work Monday to Friday. I'm going to get the holidays off. I'm not going to be constantly working when everybody else is out and having fun. And also I get to do something nice working with kids. Brilliant. I'll give it a try. And it kind of ended up being a, a lot more complicated than I think she thought, because she went from kind of producing a la carte meals for, you know, a hundred tables to having to have 500 portions of food ready for a load of um, crying children by 11 o'clock in the morning and that was quite eye-opening for her in terms of like personal skills but also understanding that you can't just go into a school and completely rip up and change everything that um in in terms of the way food is produced and the way food is served and expect the kids to just say okay everything's changed great let's get on board with that so it was this kind of it was this big journey to getting the kids to enjoy eating different varied foods to getting them to um enjoy eating fresh food so kind of taking fish and chips on a friday as as an example pretty much every school in the country just i i I don't think i've walked into a school that hasn't done fish and chips on a friday so how do you get the fish and chips from being this frozen product that you buy from breaks and get comes to live and you chuck in the fryer and stick on the counter to bringing in fresh fish and getting the kids to eat and enjoy that as well. And 
a big part of the model that was created out of that was saying, actually, exactly as you said, if you've got a really skilled head chef, they're not going to need to spend 100% of their time in the kitchen and they should be getting out into the classroom and teaching kids about food. So Nicole kind of went into the classrooms and, you know, being Maltese has a slightly different view on how food education would be delivered. And so she was doing things like teaching the kids how to butcher chicken and teaching them to cook over a fire pit in the playground. And thankfully she had Louise being this kind of um, formidable and non-frightened head teacher find her and just say okay that sounds absolutely bonkers I just won't look too closely at that it sounds quite good and it developed this model and it got quite a lot of attention and and so Louise was being kind of inundated with schools going oh my god how do I get some of this chef this sounds great and Nicole's friends were all ringing her up at kind of four o'clock in the afternoon and saying what, what do you mean you're going home what do you mean you're finished for the day what do you mean you're off at the weekends what do you mean you're not working Christmas and so we ended up with this kind of 300-ish chefs saying, how do we get involved? And 300-ish schools saying, how do we get a piece of this? And Chefs and Schools was kind of born initially out of that. And it's it's we, we've, we've grown since then. So our, our headline when we first started was, we're going to take 100 restaurant chefs and put them into 100 schools. And in doing so, prove that you can do things differently and better and enable others to follow the lead. Um, and I think we've developed quite a lot since then in that we don't, so we work now with currently with 32 schools across London um, and we've actually just reached agreement with another 40 schools. So as of next year, it will be 70 of our 100 target over five years. We don't just kind of pluck fancy restaurant chefs out of their fancy restaurants and, and put them into schools. We also train up existing school chefs um, and school cooks to be able to deliver this different model because for me that's that's really key right you have a lot of really hard working school cooks out there who want to do better and want to do more but just don't have the the skills or the training or the the, the value being attached to them to be able to do that so that's a big part of what we do um and i guess we, we we're just proving it is possible to do things differently so we are we're doing school food differently Kids are getting engaged with it. It's not costing schools more to do it. It's not costing them less, but it's not costing them more to do it. And the head teachers that we're working with are just, you know, incredibly positive about the impact that it's having in their schools. I guess the challenge for us is kind of then quantifying that um, in a way that makes a compelling argument to to the rest of the industry and to, to government to say, actually, we need to have a conversation about how we do school food, um, which is what we're working on at the moment. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. It's it's just so exciting on so many levels. So I've got too many questions. Um so let's let's just take cash as an example, right? Of mm-hmm. one of the opportunities or challenges, however you decide to perceive it. And I and I guess there must be some schools where it's actually easy because there's enough money kicking around, whether that's through the free school meals or actually the canteen is used. But then I imagine there's others where it's really hard, where maybe they've already got a team in place and they're they're already struggling to keep it solvent how do you how do you solve that presumably you need to you've either got a i suppose there's either efficiencies you can drive or you need more people to use the canteen with your experience how, how's the money side of it being resolved or do you end up subsidizing them no so the, i mean this is this is the great the the great timeless question of how school food solvent how do you make it so that it is and i think cost efficiency is has been how it's been driven for the last 30 years um i mentioned before compulsive competitive tendering being this kind of thing which drives cost reduction cost reduction cost reduction and actually you get to the and there's an element at which you you do have to look at costs and you have to say are we being as efficient as possible but if you keep cutting cost and you keep cutting quality of ingredients and you keep cutting skill of staff inevitably you're you're going to get a reduction in quality unless people are going to buy it so you have to our model is based around investing in the people in the kitchen so investing in training them investing in developing them paying them having them be properly qualified for what they're doing and then reducing the cost of food through that because actually if you have a decent skilled chef in the kitchen you are going you're not using packets which are expensive you're not using pre-made food you're making sure that you use all of the food rather than you know you know chucking loads of food in the bin so you're reducing the cost of food to offset that cost of labor and a hundred percent it's it's driving more bums on seats you do that in a couple of ways either you, you you're getting to kind of the peak of where you can of selling extra meals to to parents who can pay for it and then that's where we're saying to schools well why don't you look at once you're confident in it making it 
this is the thing that we do here. Everybody has a school meal because it has benefits outside of outside of just nutrition. So that's one way for smaller schools particularly to make it more cost effective for them. But the numbers the numbers can add up. And I'm, I wouldn't sit here and say that it's it's something that's cheaper than outsourcing. I would I would never say that, although it can be. Um, and I guess it's kind of a I think for some schools, it's kind of a, a wider question of cost benefit. So they're saying, actually, in this case, one particular school, they're saying, well, it's going to cost me more to do this. But I know that it's going to have knock on benefits for how my kids interact it's going to have knock-on benefits for their behaviour in the classroom. It's going to have knock-on benefits for their attainment. So actually, wider cost benefit, it's worth investing a bit more money into. I'm kind of wary of being drawn into the the, the conversation about in about food in schools has so, for so long been about cost that as, as much as it's important and we do have to talk about it, I'm wary about it being kind of the, the be-all and end actually not looking at the kind of the wider benefits and how important school food is. Yeah. I agree with that, but I presume the challenge for the school is it's got a certain amount, you know, it's got a limited supply of money, I suppose, isn't it? And it and it's got to divert it from something else. It's it's hard for schools to generate more cash, I suppose. Absolutely bums on seats in the canteen, bit of a no brainer. But if it's gonna say I'm gonna subsidize food more, which I a hundred percent agree with all the benefits of, presumably are the government going to give them more money? You know, can they demonstrate <laughs> or have they found, you know, basically got to cut down on the photocopying budget? Well, so I think the government giving some more money would be particularly nice because government funded meals, things like universal and preschool meals have gone up something like 2% over six years. So we got this year, we got the first ever increase since their introduction and it was 4p, which um, I'm going to say is not entirely kept pace with inflation. So it'd be nice if we weren't taking <laughs> constantly That's an out. Isn't it? yeah. <laughs> but That's then, but then yeah. such as schools right Mon- money is constantly being taken out by not being put in in the first place if you see what i mean by things not keeping pace with inflation so um I, I i do think that there is an argument around better funding for schools and i think a knock-on benefit of making sure that every child who lives in a food insecure household has access to a, a free school meal would mean also more money going into the school food system which would mean better quality um and more schools being able to do this and and i think some schools do subsidize their catering already some choose not to some have enough and and i think it's so much of it depends on different size of schools so tiny primary schools find it really really hard any any school with less than 400 pupils is going to find it really hard to Amazing. have that was my next question neutral. is yeah where's, <laughs> where's the sweet spot sorry to interrupt but exactly that is there you know have you from your experience have you gone right yes there's a number so you have so less than 400 is, less is than 400 hard. it's tricky i'm not going to say it's impossible i think you have to get creative so there's two schools that we work with in hackney completely they're not in the federation or anything like that two completely separate primary schools where the head teachers knew each other and they were both really keen to do the chefs in schools model and we we're like great it's going to cost you considerably more why don't we have a think about this and do this differently and so what we did is we found the one amazing chef um a chap called james who yeah was just really really keen to get working in schools and thought well why not do two in one go for sure so we have now one chef who works across both of those schools and in doing that the schools are then able to afford it without increasing the amount they're subsidizing in fact i think they're probably starting to drive their costs down now so there are i think you just have to be a bit creative in how you do it and if if cost is the sole issue that we look at then it's it's hard to um make arguments about improving quality but yeah. I think you have to look at both. Yeah, I think if it can wash its face, I mean, you know, just talking on a, on a very personal level with when we looked at it at my kid's primary school, uh, I was actually quite surprised. Even it, it probably is around 400 kids and it was tight, but it did look like with the amount of money they were getting in uh, for free school meals, you know, alone, that it was just about doable. Actually, the challenge more was how they were going to afford to fit out a kitchen to be able to do mm. it because, uh, you know, they could, they could, they could you know, maintain the ongoing costs and, and they weren't. You know, obviously, as a restaurateur, you go out and you you finance the kitchen over a period of time, but they they don't seem to have the same flexibility to uh, to go to the private sector. Have you have you had to help with that sort of side of stuff? So we don't we don't directly know, and actually, that's kind of that's that tends to be how schools end up in quite long relationships with outsourced providers, because outsourced providers can come in and fund a complete renovation of a kitchen or a new dining room or whatever it is, and then it's basically offered as like an, an effectively an interest free loan that's then just depreciated over the life of the contract. So that that's generally how schools 
pay for kind of improvements to dining and facilities. There was also a, a really wonderful initiative that I'd like to see repeated that the government took the money raised by the sugar by the sugar tax by the soft drinks industry levy and put 100 million pounds of that towards improvements it's called the healthy people capitals fund and it allowed schools to kind of bid into it and do things um capital projects that were um, going to improve kids health so i know some schools did tap into that to get improvement so my other my other question um was going to be around this demand side because clearly the, the simplest model would simply be to get enough people to be buying the food and it was quite interesting funny enough you mentioned fish and chips my daughter I was chatting to her this morning as part of my research to chat to you asking her a few questions and one of the things she said is oh it's fish and chips today in the, in, in the canteen it's really good I said oh great and, and she was running around a bit late hadn't made a packed lunch and I said well why don't you just buy your lunch at school and she said because her friends uh, don't want, won't sit with her in the canteen because they've got oh, pat lunches yeah. and they don't want to sit in the canteen and therefore she wanted to make a pat lunch rather than buy it even though she would love fish and chips uh, so that she could sit with her mates. So I, I liked, there was something that I read in, in, in some of your uh, information that said this idea around the kids actually being customers and this sort of desire to mm-hmm. delight them and actually to welcome them. I thought well, that's great and actually if you put some of the restaurant design elements because school canteens are all too often pretty manky looking places i'm sure Grim. that's unfair to a lot of them but uh, yeah there was no, I don't think so. and actually yeah so if you focus on you know one i suppose is letting the kids that aren't necessarily eating the school lunches eat their packed lunches in the same place because it, it sorts the social element out i guess it's also how the canteen looks and feels it, it, what's your experience of that and is that the sort of thing you've you've had to help on as well as just making the space desirable as well as the food yeah definitely and I think primary schools and secondary schools are so different and there's this kind of it's understanding in in primary schools you have to kind of make a compelling argument to parents about why they should save themselves the time and effort of making a packed lunch and send their kids in for a hot meal and that's mostly about giving parents confidence in secondary schools you have to win the hearts and minds of teenagers which is just like this yeah often quite quite challenging particularly if you ever to make the mistake of going into a secondary school and talking about healthy food and just watch as the kind of drove of people walk in the opposite direction and say, not for me, thank you, which is this weird kind of negative connotation that we have around it. But there we go. So we don't talk about healthy food. That's kind of rule rule one for secondary schools. Um, and, and rule two is ex- exactly as you say, it's kind of what can you do about the environment? And if you can't change the environment too much, what can you do within the environment to make it more enticing? And, and how are you engaged with kids? So doing things like doing kind of pop-ups so getting a couple of barbecues out in the playground and having kind of a pop-up barbecue in a school in Hanso that we were working with we arranged a street food market so they had a week where they had different street food providers coming in um, which was incredible and getting all the kids kind of out there and excited and talking about food and once once they'd done that once they were excited and talking about food they were a lot more interested in kind of oh well actually we've got a new chef in the in the canteen and oh let's go and kind of like let's go and see that maybe it'll be the same as this amazing street food that we had so i think i think you have to create you have to create demand so in secondary schools what we recommend they do now is when when they if they've got a new chef starting or if their chef's been through a training program and they're ready to launch a completely new food offer don't put it on the counter put it outside, put it somewhere else and create it. It's this kind of thing that has a bit of a buzz around it. Like, oh, there's this new thing. There's only 200 portions of it. We have to be first in the queue, otherwise we won't get to taste it. And then once they're excited about it, and once they're climbing all over each other, creating kind of mini riots that head teachers love, then you start introducing that into the main counter. And, you know, if if you, if schools can invest in dining rooms and areas to make them more enticing, that's brilliant. It's not always it's not always achievable but i think you can do a lot without doing that although we are we are in the business hilariously of kind of going around and encouraging schools to get graffiti artists in which i'm gonna say is really effective it looks very cool and the kids get then quite excited about it but obviously that's not that enticing to all secondary school head teachers but i think you just i think you have to be novel and i think you have to take the kind of experience that you have in commercial environments so my, my background is in contract catering but i started my career midpoint rather and was working in business and industry so putting kind of cafes and restaurants into fancy companies headquarters and trying to create a buzz around those so and Nicole's background has always been in restaurants so it's kind of taking that commercial experience of how do you convince paying customers to part with their cash and taking that into schools and saying actually you have to not even imagine you have to recognize that these kids are your customers and that you have to 
address their concerns and that you have to make food look enticing and that you have to get them talking about it and buzzing about it in order to get them to then eat it i think mm. yeah I, I love it it's 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 the, the dark art of yeah of entertaining <laughs> teenagers but <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the street food's cool isn't it and, and we are lucky you know with bake-off shows and all this kind of mm. stuff i do think there's an interest in food you're absolutely right you can't call it healthy i you know i try with my kids to talk about you know even the word nutritious turns them off i'm like what other words have i got you know and whole foods you know at least it'll go and look let's just get back to real food that's not made in a factory that's that's as whole what are the actual ingredients in that food but i love the idea of taking the food out particularly in the moment i think the problem with covid is that you know they've 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 now over regulated the sort of canteen spaces so much that the kids just Mm. don't want to go in there it's just a horrible environment they've got to stay apart and wear masks and and i sympathize because obviously that's what they've got to do but actually the opportunity would be to yeah take the food out to the kids and they take it out to the playground build some little little pop-ups it can still all be made in the kitchen potentially can't it but i love i I love that idea and make it make it cool and make it relevant um have you got some examples i suppose of where you've gone into a school to help and, and there's been this sort of huge change where you've gone in and you know maybe the food was bad the engagement was bad kids weren't using the canteen but you've come out the other side of it with with you know completely completely different scenario and and if so sort of you know can you give any examples of the sort of stuff that happened and what happened in that time period or how, how long was the time period yeah sure so i think I'd, I'd go back to the the school where we did the street food market because i think that's a really great example. quite a kind of it was quite a tough environment to go into so the, the food when we went in there that it had it was already run in-house but the team hadn't been given kind of much direction or much training and the food was kind of like 90s level smiley faces and um these panini i just can't ever get over the paninis the paninis that you can cook stick packet which just blew my mind i didn't know that was even a thing i'm not sure it's even plastic anyway so the food food was not 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 brilliant and we went for the kind of thing of creating the buzz and getting the kids excited about it. And we did the street food market and then started introducing that into the main counters. And it's really tricky in secondary schools. If you go too far, too fast, kids vote with their feet. And we absolutely had that experience somewhere else. We went too far, too fast. And somebody was slipping around the playground going, it's all healthy now. And so the kids just kind of rioted and and, and left. And we were kind of head in hands going, this has had slightly the opposite impact, but, in in this in this other school we were um we were able to then get kids on board and get kids excited about it and the school at the end of the first year were able to balance the books in the in, at the same level at, as they had done previously whilst having made this kind of quite dramatic transformation in terms of how food was served the team increased in size you had a new head chef you had a new sous chef and they trained up the rest of the team as well who were then sort of kind of becoming these ambassadors going around getting really excited about fresh food so it is it's definitely possible to do i would be lying if i, I said it was easy but we're, we're now seeing kind of more secondary schools getting excited and getting interested and there's another school that we're working with over in totteridge where they've at the same time as working with us ha- have a um, relationship with a project called Grow, um, which has built a kind of working farm on the site. So these kids are not only getting excited about food that they're eating in the dining room, but they're also getting to go out and experience kind of livestock and growing food. And I think you have to be bold. I think that would be my kind of big takeaway is that doing doing things the same way and making little tweaks is is not enough. You do you do have to be bold, um, and you have to be willing to do things that are a little bit off the wall. I think. Mm. so that that example there which sounds amazing sort of you know a farm on site i would love that it, it, do you generally does this need to be sort of led by a particularly interested and motivated head teacher that's got an interest is that where the demand generally comes from nothing happens in a school without the head teacher wanting it to mm. and so we in, in 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 my experience if the head teacher isn't on board it doesn't matter if the entire rest of the school including the governing body is really excited to make the change it just won't happen and that in and of itself kind of presents an interesting challenge because we'll we'll get so we have a database of hundreds of schools who are really interested in working with us which is great but we don't want to change food in 300 400 schools we want to change food and get you know 30,000 schools excited about it so I think that's where it kind of goes to a bit of a game of 3D 3D chess of how do you start changing people's perception around school food 
how do you get head teachers to perceive school food as being important to recognize that it has benefits beyond because I, th- I think there's a lot of head teachers who would be more interested if they saw school food as something more than it was and also saw it as a solvable problem I think there's a plenty of teachers out there who walk past the dining room look at the food go god that's awful never mind it's I've got so many other priorities to deal with it's too much it, I've tried I've had 15 different catering contractors over the last 15 years it can't be done so we just accept it and actually us and other organizations and and you know good providers being able to get out there and say it is possible to do it better here's why it matters here's the funding from government thank you very much to make sure it happens that's the 3d chess that's how that's how we're going to get beyond the kind of three or four hundred schools yeah and the, the slightly depressing, I, I, I mean, I love your optimism. And even when you say things that are generally horrific, you still say them with a smile in your voice, which is brilliant. So well, well done. I can see, I see why, you're, why you do this. Um, but I, and, and, I, and I share that. But all too often, you know, I worry about the significant, as I alluded to before, really, I suppose the significant proportion of people who just aren't interested in, in mm. food and nutrition and where it comes from, let alone, you know, then trying to convince the head. I don't know, it just must become an ever to sort of diminishing number of people that are interested. So a real challenge. But it, I, I guess the key thing you can do is just is just lead by example, demonstrate, tell stories, case studies, show what's happened in schools. Um, I, I also guess that a lot of heads would be, and you spoke about this then, I guess when you get it wrong, a lot of heads would be terrified of this sort of, you know, this, this fine knife edge, I guess they're on between um, as much as anything, you know, needing to feed the kids, it being solvent in some way and, mm-hmm. and screwing that up and seeing it sort of, you know, go down the pan. You've now presumably got a wealth of experience. And is, is that one of the key things that people would come to you for is to say, look, we've got all the motivation, we've got the desire, we just don't have the experience, we don't want to screw it up. Presumably you can sort of hold schools' hands through this and go, look, we can't guarantee you that we'll nail it, but we can at least demonstrate to you, you know, the experience we've had. It, it, exactly that, yeah. And I think I think key for us is also making sure that it's something that's sustainable because too too often you kind of you for example, if you're if you outsource and you get someone new comes in loads of enthusiasm really brilliant food for a few weeks and then things slip back and at the end of the three-year contract cycle you're going out to someone else with the same problems that you came into it with so key f- for us is like how do you change it and how do you make it sustainable so yeah we get we the head teachers that come to us and we, we don't go out and kind of advertise it is a case of people coming to us are people who are like i'm just endlessly frustrated with how crap food is been for however long how do we make it change i i want to do it i don't know how to so our aim is to set them up to be sustainable. So that's making sure that they've got, as well as all the nice food and all of that nice bit, that they've got a food safety management system in place. They've got um, a way of recording all of that data. They've got um, a way of ordering that they know that they're getting decent prices from suppliers and making sure that their chef, whether it's a chef who's worked there for 30 years who we've trained or a new chef that we've brought in to support the team, making sure that that person is supported because they they are effectively going to be, you are the kind of expert in school now on everything food. So how do we keep them supported? How do we keep them excited? How do we keep innovation going in? So part of what we're doing is we're establishing the Chefs Alliance, which is kind of this alliance of all of the different chefs that we've placed or that we've met who work directly for schools and saying, well, how do we support you? Do we, you know, we, we pre, pre-COVID and will again post-COVID arranging kind of visits out to go and see new innovative food trends, taking them out for meals, taking them to talks, arranging, um, arranging different events for them, just so that they also have a network to tap into. Because I think if you don't if you don't make it sustainable, what's the point in doing it? Um, yeah, and and like I said, too often changes changes and improvements aren't sustainable. So we want to make sure that not only are we making the kind of immediate change, but we're also making sure that it lasts. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise it does slip back. Yeah, amazing. Okay, good. Right. So I understand the problem. I understand some of the ways that you can help solve it to to get into some of the specifics i suppose of how many people can you help you know do you have a lot more schools getting in touch is there a lot more demand for your help than resources that you can necessarily allocate to help or not <laughs> i mean the the simple answer is yes i think you're only ever constricted by the amount of resource that you have and i also i would top and tail that by saying that Although loads of additional resource to go out to go to another hundred schools next year would be nice, I don't think we'd do it because we'd want to make sure we stay close enough to make sure it's done to the same standard. So what we, what we're trying to work out is 
we set these one or maybe 200 over five years schools up as um, as kind of beacons of best practice showing what's possible. How do we then take parts of that and make it so it's accessible to, to thousands of other schools? So we're working on a really big project at the moment. We're incredibly lucky to work with some amazing funders, one of whom is Guys in St. Thomas's Charity. Um, and they work, their work is predominantly place based in Southwark and Lambeth. And they are funding us to develop a pilot which is going to extract this really intensive training program that we give to school kitchen teams for how to make it um, how to make these improvements and turn that into a professional qualification that we can roll out to thousands of schools and that for me has kind of two big benefits and also benefits the industry because it's not just about saying here's a training program plenty of people either do training or pay lip service to doing craft training we're saying actually it's it's much more about more than craft training it's also understanding kids nutrition it's also understanding how to get kids excited about trying different things it's understanding kind of emotional intelligence of how to manage a team which is is tricky anywhere but particularly weird and tricky in schools for reasons i won't kind of bore you with now um and it's so so that that's a program that we're developing and and the side benefit of that i think is it's also helping to professionalize school food i think there's this thing that we have of the school cook is tina and lives around the corner and comes in for three or four hours a day and you know she's not a professional she's just the cook she comes in through the back door and leaves through the back door and never should anybody see the kind of bottom half of her body because you only see her serving over the counter and actually what we're saying is no tina is like a really important person in school who's doing a really really vital job that's serving kids food that's going to change their eating habits for life it's going to change how they study in the afternoon it's going to you know it's really important so that should be a professional qualification so it's not about moving tina it's about saying tina giving tina the training and the skills and the professional recognition that everybody else in the school gets five days of training a year and gets all of these kind of added benefits and gets professionally you know accredited training why why is the why are the school cooks left out of that so that's that's an exciting project that we're developing and that we're hoping after the pilot that we kind of get engagement with the school meals industry to say this is something that we think will really benefit you as well because the more we professionalize school food and the more we emphasize how important it is the more likely it is that more people will put money into it whether that's government funding or parents buying it or whatever it is the more kind of the more attention that we bring to the importance and the and the standard of school food then the better it will be for everybody yeah, such an uh, you know a, a amazing um, opportunity and can have such an impact. Are there are there others in this sector that are on this sort of same journey with you? Because it, it feels like a uh, a monumental opportunity, but also a monumental challenge and task. And I would imagine frustratingly time consuming. Because I love the idea that you know you've got thirty seven, you're going to add forty, and and it makes absolute sense that you take all of that learning and you distill it and you turn it into a movement, and then other people can follow it. And I suppose it's sort of open source learning. But I guess. <laughs> takes time are there others helping yeah definitely so we and i i we've always i've always had quite a collaborative approach to doing things i don't think that one organization gets to do everything and gets to be the kind of be all and end all of um everything so we've always been quite collaborative but we i think the impacts of coronavirus has meant that everybody's working much more closely with everyone else than they might have done before so we have really good relationships with other charities who work within the sector so we work really closely with people like bite back 2030 um, who are a charity that was established by jamie oliver as this kind of new vehicle for trying to reduce levels of childhood obesity we work with school food matters who are a fantastic charity who've you know been chipping away at this problem for over a decade themselves and and food foundation who have kind of an interest in the child poverty angle particularly so loads of different people out there we're definitely not trying to do it all by ourselves and you know as i said before also engaging more and more with the school meals industry because they're the you know people out there making food pr predominantly in most of the schools in the country it's either local authority or um, catering contractors doing the kind of the bulk so we're trying to engage with as many of them as possible learn from them about kind of what's working and what isn't working and work out ways in which our programs can complement or enhance what they're doing so I, I definitely think it's about being collaborative mm. 
I think we'd be swimming in treacle if we weren't working with other yeah, people. Yeah, you would. Yeah, well, yeah you wouldn't. Sometimes wouldn't it feels like chip. it. <laughs> I bet it does. Yeah, I'd be overwhelmed sometimes. Uh, you're right about using the existing school meals industry. I would imagine on one side they must be a little bit nervous because I suppose if you try to do things in house. But but the flip side is, you know, some of those companies are huge, aren't they? They're big budgets, and actually, if they do. You know, at the end of the day, all boats are lifted on a rising tide, aren't they? So if everybody's got mm-hmm. the same overall motivation, which is around education and, and, and poverty and uh, obesity and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, you know, they should have the resources to send it, you know, it, particularly schools, I suppose, that aren't big enough to necessarily have a, a sort of stay in chef all of the time. They, sh- they should be perfectly placed to have people that can, you know, go between schools and help out with the curriculum and the sort of nutritional ideas and be well resourced. Are, are you getting much sort of positive engagement, I suppose, along that? lines with them or are they just sort of terrified of you (laughs) (laughs) i mean i wouldn't be so um egotistical as to think they were terrified of humble little old us but um, (laughs) i I, I take the point in that you know theoretically we could be a competitor in in, in some kind of small element so in a school here or there but you know we're we're realistically we're talking about 100 200 schools when there's you know 30,000 schools out there and i've always said and i think you know we all feel this that there's not there's not one right model of doing it. I don't think that schools running their catering in-house is the only way to make school food great. I think that investing in the people who make the food and in get, uh, integrating the food that they're making with lessons in the classroom is the way to make school food great. That's that's mm-hmm. kind of key, right? And that doesn't have to be done by us. That doesn't have to be done by the cater links or the selectos or the compasses. It can be done by anybody. So we're now, you know, we are engaging with with catering providers more, particularly in development of the pilot for the professional qualification. But also we've just developed a relationship with a local authority who have a traded services who do catering for about uh, 70 odd schools. So we're we're going to work with them. I can't say who it is yet. I don't think otherwise I'll get in trouble and I'm trying not to get in trouble so much. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll be announcing that in the new year. And that's that's really exciting because that's an opportunity to help them integrate our kind of learnings about how you do food differently, how you get kids engaged with it within, you know, a, a already really well established catering provider. So no, I mean it's it's exciting and we're definitely, definitely um we're getting really positive noises from the people that we're speaking to. And I do I do think people recognise that there is you know, there are financial benefits, you know, these are companies that, yes, are interested in reducing obesity and doing the right thing, but they are also commercial companies whose foremost priority is to to make money. And at the end of the day, there are financial benefits to improving school food and getting more people buying it. So it, it's it's a win win for everyone. Let's all get involved with it. Yeah, no, it makes makes perfect sense, and and I, I do think there is this sort of sense of collaboration has come out of the back of COVID much better than it did before. Are you still purely uh, London centric, and the, the new force you're adding also London? Uh, so I'm proud to announce we now have one school outside of London that's in Surrey. But <laughs> Not far, <laughs> we're making, maybe, but we're, it's we're, we're making strides. <laughs> no, so we 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 are really keen to get outside of London. Um, I don't think that what we're doing is London centric. I think probably the menus that the schools that we work with are producing are probably London centric, but I don't think the model itself is. So I don't think it's going to be difficult for us to kind of move those learnings somewhere else. I think we might have to, you know, think long and hard about different kind of menus for different areas and how we help people work out what those are but it is our goal to get outside of London it was on the books for this year we had some little hiccups and changes in plans for reasons I'm sure everyone understands that means that it wasn't able for us to focus kind of wholeheartedly on that but the plan is 2021 what on earth have you been doing with yourself Naomi I don't know (laughs) I don't know things happened I won't go on about it but Uh, (laughs) we did things differently for about six months of our year Uh, but yeah no next year next year the plan is to go out we're in talks with a um an academy trust um in the northeast I would really really love for us to go northeast go southwest find the kind of pockets out so we focus our work predominantly in areas with the highest levels of socio-economic deprivation precisely because of all the things i've said before about um, food poverty about malnutrition and about obesity being you know obviously so much focused in those areas so yeah we're excited to explore what getting out of london means
Yeah, it is exciting. Yeah, well, I, I'll be a, a local ambassador, and we do actually have one of the most deprived areas in the UK. Not all of Bournemouth; much of it is far too flash. But it, 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 I'm not even embarrassing. It's just the reality. But there's um, there's there's pockets of deprivation locally where, and some real challenge schools where mm. I'm sure you would be um, very welcomed. It, it's part of the opportunity to solve that. Then is around funding. So I've got to draw to a close. I could chat to you all day, but um, how are you? How are you funded? I, I suppose there's never enough cash, but have you got a stable supply of investment and? Are there any key players that, that help in that? In fact, one of the motivations to get in touch, although I've been aware of your work for a long time and have been meaning to get in touch, but when I saw that Will Beckett from uh, the lovely Hawksmoor had donated £10,000 a couple of weeks ago because of some of the amazing stuff that you've been doing um, during COVID, um, that motivated me to get in touch. So yeah, wh- where and how are you funded and do you need more support with that? Uh, yeah, if I can just really quickly just touch on the point about Hawksmoor and just give you a one minute ode to my love to the restaurant industry, my love of the restaurant industry. And what an incredible industry. The first people that stepped forward when you know we were working out how do we give an emergency response was the restaurant industry, which were also the industry were facing just this most enormous kind of existential crisis of, of their lifetimes. And they were the first people going, OK, can we cook? Can we give money? Can we give you leftover food? It's just an amazing industry. And, and Will and his team at Hawksmoor gave us so much support over the last six months so they really are fantastic but also people like Oaxaca just I, I could go on and on just a moment to just show my appreciation um well, yeah, and, and, if, and if, before you go on if I can add to that I mean it's been such a humbling to witness it and and so proud of the sector to see it step up and and you're right you know absolutely on its knees and continues to be so but it demonstrates that at our core you know it's hospitality it, it's yeah. not money it is a reflex to look after people and you know for thousands of years whether it's been inns that you know people have needed to stay in when they're in remote places you know hotels as a service i just think it's a beautiful sector and it comes out of this with its head held high albeit there's a lot of people that aren't going to come through it which is which is terribly distressing so yes i I share your um your gushing enthusiasm i suppose for how it's handled itself so i I hope that many of my peers come out the other side of this oh so do i so do i sorry um yeah no what was the question was around funding funding. yes yes yeah access to cash so we are in a really good position going into this year but facing obviously the same uncertainties as everybody else so having kind of really strong ongoing relationships with funders is 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 really important because in the world of charities you kind of you can have know that you've got income for the year but the next year i i have no idea and i have no certainty around that so we have we have different relationships we we work with certain food foodie people who um whose values align with us so people like Hawksmoor um a wonderful global food trends agency the food people we've just started working with um, and they provide us support but also kind of platforms to go and talk to people about what we're doing which is brilliant and we also get funding from um, trusts and foundations so we have brilliant and and livery the livery companies in london so we work with people like um, esme fairburn uh, fishmongers livery uh Garfield Western Foundation have funded us. The Mark Lennon Trust, which um, is a fantastic trust, has given us a long kind of a long term uh, amount of support. Um, so loads of people I haven't mentioned who I definitely should, but I would be here all day if I tried to list everybody. But we get funding from a mix of places. We also generate income. So we opened a school of food two weeks before the entire country went into national lockdown. Um, but it's a wonderful cookery school in, in in Hackney, which is not only helping to kind of offer opportunities for a local community to get involved in growing and cooking, but it's also a base for us to be able to share the wonderful chefs that we've got and share those experiences with other people. So we're hoping to generate some income through that and through our work with schools. Um, and then in the long term, you know, with this qualification i'm hoping that that will also be you know a stream of income for us i I think sustainability for anybody right now is kind of having a mix of different ways in which you you have income as a charity a lot of it is donated um and we have some fantastic individual donors who support us and particularly around the child food poverty stuff we're finding that people are really really keen to support specifically the campaigning work which is great because it's actually quite tricky to raise money for that specifically so having the support of individual givers is, is really helpful yeah okay amazing is there anything um quick wins i guess because you, you know you clearly you're busy if you're adding another another 40 people next year it's brilliant so if, if there's a either a school listening who's feeling you know particularly inspired or maybe a parent or just you know somebody in their local community feeling inspired by what we've chatted to are there, are there any quick wins are there any things they can do that aren't just uh 
you know create a partnership with you i suppose is there is there thing questions they can ask the school i suppose or, or just you know start sending kids in with money to use the canteen have you have you got any advice you would give people 100 percent. if you're a parent go and have a look at the food and and go and if you can see if the head teacher will let you go in and eat go and eat the food go and look at the food talk to your kids about the food understand you know what it is that's going on and if it's great brilliant support the school and encourage other parents um if you're a head teacher and you, you're walking past the dining room and kind of shuddering slightly but thinking i'll deal with that later don't it is something it is a mountain that is climbable do tackle it it is worthwhile even if it might be tricky for a couple of months it's so worthwhile in the long run um and yeah if you i guess if you're if you're a child listening to this i don't imagine there are but if <laughs> i don't imagine there are so many but if you are even getting my kids to listen is a struggle maybe but you never know <laughs> <laughs> if you are then it, you know again you know get, get excited about food if you're not excited about the food in your school then speak to people about it tell your head teacher demand change <laughs> yeah Perfect. All right. Well, that's great. You know, it's nice to have some actions that people can actually look. Yeah, um, brilliant. So I could I could chat to you for another two hours. One day I'm going to come up to the Hackney School of Food and take a look, and, and we'll meet in person and, and grab a coffee. I hope, Naomi. But look, just thanks so much for doing what you do. It clearly it has the potential to help solve you know so many challenges. And uh, yeah, I'm both I'm both sort of I suppose. Uh, you know in awe of the momentousness of the challenge ahead but also just you know sort of super grateful and excited and just think it's such an awesome sector to be involved in and uh, wish you the very best of luck with the future but thank you so much for taking the time to chat and uh yeah good good luck solving all of the i'm going to call them opportunities and not challenges but i really <laughs> appreciate you taking the time there thank you so much it was a pleasure to chat Right, I hope you are feeling inspired about all things food education and I hope you learned something interesting during that conversation. Personally, it's an area I hope to continue to focus time on and I will be reaching out to some of my local schools uh, to learn more and I'll try and keep you posted on what I find out. Uh, now, Naomi and I had a little audio problem towards the end of that chat where some of the resources that she was referring to could not be heard, so I, I cut them out. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, take a look at the Chefs in Schools website and the school food plan online uh, and take a look at what works well, uh, the link on that page for some great information and downloadable content that will ramp up your knowledge uh, or you can use it directly in your school or with your kids. And uh, I will put links to all of this as well as the social media channels in the show notes on the humansofhospitality.co.uk website. Uh, and remember, if you want useful links like that, just to land in your inbox each week to save you hunting for them, you can just subscribe to the newsletter via the website. There's a little capture form right at the bottom of the homepage. But uh, yeah, everything will be up there with the show notes for this episode. Okay, that's it. Uh, I've got a couple more episodes to record pre-Christmas, and then we'll be taking a little break for a few weeks over the festive period, and we'll be back around the second week of January for year three of podcast learning. Um, thank you so much for joining me on the 2020 adventure. It has been uh, somewhat more challenging than we were expecting at the tar start of the year, but uh, talking to peers across the country has certainly helped me uh, and my sanity and I hope it's helped you as well. But for now, have a great week and uh, I'll be back next Monday. Cheers.